Why, hello there. Welcome to Smart Aspirations with Justin Huff. Sit back, chill out, and go on a journey around the world. Around the world. Justin will discuss tales of hope, discovery, and general irreverence with some of the most dynamic personalities in the travel business. Remember, we do cool shit, and so can you. Good day, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Today we have, it goes without saying, the absolute honor of speaking with Dr. Jack Wheeler from Wheeler Expeditions. Jack has been called the real-life Indiana Jones, and that's certainly not an understatement. Jack has been to every single country on this planet. As of 2014, uh, he collected every single passport stamp. But that honor is not the only reason what makes Jack Wheeler so special by far. Uh, We first crossed crossed paths in about five or six years ago or so. And we were working together on a a trip called, we called the country, Jack actually called it the countries that don't exist. And that was a really, really cool itinerary that um, included Somalia, Somaliland, Puntland, and places like um, South Ossetia and and Abkhazia, which were actually uh, annexed by Russia at a time when I actually lived in Moscow. And um, we absolutely connected with the same enthusiastic spirit to discover the most far-flung castaway destinations on earth to to broaden our horizon as humans and and to really understand how we all fit together um and when i when i started swaggy swan uh, about a year or so after jack and i reconnected and we've started working together um i really wanted him to come on to not only talk about his fascinating life and again understatement uh, it, but I also wanted him to talk about, uh, he's leading a helicopter expedition to the Himalayas this fall. And again, this spring that completely blew my mind. And I'll save that part of the interview, um, to talk about, um, instead of talking about it here, I wanted you to hear it from Jack himself. Um, and we'll also put links on, on our YouTube channel, uh, where you can find out more about both of what Jack and I are doing together. Uh, just a quick bio before, um, I hand it over to him. Uh, Jack was born in 43 in Southern California in Glendale, and he by, by the age of 12, he was the youngest ever Eagle Scout in U.S. history. Um, at age 14, he was the youngest person to ever summit the Matterhorn. In age 16, he was adopted by a tr- an Amazonian tribe of, of headhunters in the, in the um, Ecuadorian Amazon as part of their family. Uh, he began Wheeler Expeditions in 76. Uh, he also, <laughs> I love this. He parachuted. He went parachuting in the North Pole, uh, a Guinness Book of World Records, which still stands, I believe, and just completely, completely blew my mind. Parachuting in the North Pole. Um, he dabbled in politics as well. Um, his he wasn't there for too long, but his impact was. Incredibly powerful. Um, Jack worked with the Reagan administration in the early '80s, and he he went. He was sent out to um, to Angola, to Afghanistan, um, to learn more about uh, what these little sensitive parts of the world were going through during the peak of the Soviet Empire. And Jack ended up. He came back, and his findings actually contributed to. Jack was one of the architects of the Reagan Doctrine which served as a central part of U.S. foreign policy for the better part of a decade. And um, since then, he's been dedicating himself uh, to, he dedicated himself to reaching out and seeing as as many places that he could as possible. Um, And also working with his company, Wheeler Expeditions and Adventure Travel. So without further ado, I will give it over to Jack and myself. And we really, really hope you enjoy it. Again, Jack is a really, really special guest. And um, without further ado, here's Dr. Jack Wheeler. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining Smart Aspirations with Justin Huff. We are absolutely thrilled to have the real-life Indiana Jones (laughs) (laughs) joining us from his home in Portugal as of right now. And uh, Jack Wheeler, thank you so much. Dr. Jack Wheeler, thank you so much for joining us. Jack has been, he's one of the few brave souls that has been to 
every single country on earth, sometimes multiple times. And you must have started doing this at a really young age. Was there any moment that inspired you in your young life to say, hey, that there's this great broad horizon out there. Let's go see some of it. Uh, yes, there is. Um, I was born in a very prosaic uh, sub suburb of Los Angeles, uh, Glendale, Glendale, California, mm -hmm. bedroom community. Uh, the, the grammar school and the junior high and the high school were all, you know, right there, the walk to it, you know. Um, so I didn't know much of anything about the world. Um, and I read a book. I was 14 years old. I'm from Glendale. I don't know much about anything. And this book, actually, it's in my bookcase right there. And um, it was by a a very famous adventurer of the 1920s and 30s. His name was Richard Halliburton. Mm -hmm. By the time I read this, no, nobody had completely forgotten, uh, et cetera. But a friend of my father's, um, he gave this book to me as a, as a birthday present. By the way, I understand it's your birthday today. Yes, it is. Is that true? It Happy is. Happy birthday. Happy Thank birthday. Thank you so, so much. So, so at any rate, um, uh, it was called Richard Halliburton's The Complete Book of Marvels. And I thought, you know, I'm 14. I thought it was a dumb title, but it was a rainy Saturday afternoon and there was no internet in those days, right? What you did, a kid on a Saturday, you got on your bike and you went to see friends. You, there was a little mountain behind us, Mount Verdugo. I'd go hiking around. I mean, I'd get outside. But, uh, and there's no, there was three television channels, right? I mean, there's... You know, there's no Netflix or any of this stuff. So uh, I picked up this book and I started reading. And I could not believe it. Uh, black and white pictures. But it was filled with pictures of where Halliburton went. And I, as a, I read it and it made me realize that there wasn't just this world out there like Paris and France and and Tokyo or something. I mean, it was, the world was filled with all these amazing places and these amazing things to do. And uh, I never forgot it as long as I lived. Uh, it's still with me to this day. Uh, but what really hit me was uh, Albert Burton's Climbing the Matterhorn. Okay. He called it the Tiger of the Alps, the most famous mountain in the world. And uh, that inspired me. Somehow, I got it in my head to uh, ask my dad about it. And um, uh, I knew we were going to Europe because um, he was filming a documentary of an American family in Europe. And in 1958, this is a long, long time ago, it was a big deal to go to Europe, mm -hmm. a big deal. And the television station, of course, was paying for it. And we got a free trip to Europe. <laughs> um, but as uh, luck would have it, I was able to climb the Matterhorn. So, um, and at the time, I was supposedly the youngest person to do it. I just followed my guide up. And, and, um, but uh, that's the experience that I said, I want to, this is what I want my life to be about. You can, you know, people collect things. Mm -hmm. They collect stamps or they collect porcelain or they collect, you know, collect things. And, uh, I, I decided when I was 14, I was going to collect extraordinary experiences for my life. That's what I wanted my life to be. You can lose your stamp collection, but you can never lose what you've done. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my life has been pretty much like that ever since. That's incredible. And uh, to relate to that, I kind of grew up in a very similar situation and a sim similar surroundings. And, and to have that first experience of the outside world kind of kind of bite you and it's a bug and it mm -hmm. never lets it never lets go and so how old were you when you climbed the Matterhorn if you don't mind my asking 14 14 and if I'm not mistaken you you also summited the Matterhorn with your son is that right oh wow yes right well um I was lucky enough to meet and marry an extraordinary woman 
and uh, we're still together after all these years. Scary to mention how many years. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. But uh, at any rate, um, our first son is Brandon. And uh, when he turned 14, uh, Brandon came to me and says, Dad, I'd like to ask you something. I said, sure, buddy. And he said, well, you climbed the Matterhorn when you were 14. Well, um, I'm 14 now. And how about us climbing the Matterhorn together? And it almost made me cry. Of course. And it brings tears to my eyes right now. Because, I mean, how good can it get, you know? Yeah. When your son asks you that. Not, can I climb the Matterhorn, Dad? Would you send me to Europe and, 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 and uh, get a guide, etc.? No, he wanted to do it with me, with, you. with his dad. And of course, I said yes. I said, "Oh my word!" So we, uh, I said, "I'll give it a shout," because it was forty years later. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's you know, that's a long time. I, you know, it's Matterhorn is you got to climb four thousand feet straight up and straight back down real quick because the storms come up mm -hmm. and the weather can change really fast. Uh, so. At any rate, um, uh, Brandon, we got him a Swiss guide, a young Swiss guide. I had an old veteran guide, climbing the Matterhorn, how many, how many times? And um, uh, we got up to uh, near the um, uh, near the Schultes Ice Field, and um, uh, I was running out of gas, and my guide said maybe we should not so we should stop and i begged him to go on mm -hmm. but um brandon brandon went ahead with his guide and uh he made it and but he was you know crying because he's not with his dad mm -hmm. he thought that he had already gone down because he couldn't see me i mean it's okay. steep and he couldn't see me okay. and so he started coming down and i'm coming up and he couldn't believe it. He said, you're still here. I said, yes, yes. And I said, what am I, God, what are you doing? I mean, what am I on this mountain for, you know? And so he, he pointed to his, the Swiss guide and he said, we're going back. That's amazing. And there was about 500 feet to go. And um, I stood on the Matterhorn again with my son. That's him. And I'll never forget it. Of course, we'll, neither one of us will forget it as long as we live. What a moment. Yeah. And the fact that he wanted to do that with you, and it sounds like knowing you, we've known each other for not too long, but for a while now, you, if you don't seem like the person that would kind of force your lifestyle upon him and he's kind of like made free to make his own decisions and the fact that he wanted to do that with you, it's, yes. that's complete magic, Jack. That's a yeah. wonderful moment. Yeah. Um, when, when you first summited this, it looks like you, you okay, I've summited Matterhorn, and I could, my life could go a few different ways. Uh, you didn't automatically start Wheeler Expeditions right there on the Matterhorn. No. That was, going, you, <laughs> that you was know, a while later. <laughs> that was a while later. So, but yeah. you're like, okay, I don't want to do tourism. How, how did you, from, from an actual day-to-day -day career in different industries and fields, can you walk me through where you went from there and like through your studies and, and how you eventually wound up in tourism? Wow. Um, okay. Um, well, the, the, the way I made money in those days, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a kid and I live at home, etc. cetera. Uh, but uh, I would give, um, I was pretty good at judo. Okay. You know, and so I give uh, judo lessons to other kids in a dojo, you know, it was a dojo in Hollywood. Sure. And, uh, um, and uh, tennis lessons. I give mm -hmm. tennis lessons to other kids. Uh, so th that's pretty much how I, I made any money when, when I was in high school. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm 16, 15, 16. And uh, I, there was all these, all these friends of my father were always coming by. Mm -hmm. My father was a well-known television personality in, in Los Angeles. And um, uh, so we're sitting around the living room, and I'd always be invited. 
And uh, so this one uh, fellow, uh, he said, so young Jack, uh, uh, you know, talking about the matter. And he said, what are you going to do next? Live with headhunters? And, <laughs> you know, he, he thought that was, that was funny and people were laughing and I wasn't laughing. I said, uh, <laughs> what, what headhunters? And he said, oh, I read this story about, I don't know, Saturday Evening Post magazine about this, this medical doctor who studied the plants that the, the headhunters made to shrink human heads in the Amazon. And uh, so, uh, you know, I thought it was interesting. And, and uh, you should go live with headhunters. And so, of course, everybody's laughing, etc. And I... Took him seriously <laughs> because I know I'm starting to go. To, I'm, I'm going to enter UCLA. I'm going to study anthropology. So I went down to the Ecuadorian embassy and um, uh, in Los Angeles, and I said, "Do you know anything about um, a doctor who studies the Gila Rose in in the uh, in the Amazon?" And uh, they said, "Oh, that's Dr. Ferguson. Yes, he comes in here to get his visas. Now, this could be any place in the United States, right? Sure. Uh, but no, he said oh, he comes here. I said, where is he? He, said, well, he has a, a clinic in uh, in Riverside. Well, I mean, that from Glendale to Riverside is like an hour or something away. I mean, yeah. how? What? You know? So, so um, I wrote him a letter and I said, I'm starting anthropology, uh, you know, etc. And he said, Well." You know, so he, we ended up inviting me to come down and, and see him. And my folks said, well, it'll be safe. He'll be with a doctor who has been there, blows it, you know, et cetera. They thought it was pretty crazy. And I had saved up all my money. And what do you need? You need an airline ticket. And, and that's it because there's no hotels in the jungle, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course. So, um, so at any rate, I ended up um, spending a summer and uh, with this group of clan of Hivero or Shwar as they call themselves, Shwara. And um, uh, the, the chief's name was Tangamashi. And Tangamashi actually adopted me into his family. Oh my gosh. And uh, he showed me how to make a shrunken head. And I mean, this is the real deal. I and mean, real, real tenors. And uh, it was an unbelievable experience. And uh, so it's just been one thing after that. But um, but then um, then I read another book. <laughs> <laughs> books do this to me. I've got two thousand books over here, <laughs> and uh, uh, so I read a book um, uh, on a I was on a beach in Malibu, and I'd much rather be surfing. But I promised these friends of mine I'd read this book, and I'm not happy. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I came upon this one passage in the book. And um, it was Atlas Shrugged. Sure. If you're familiar yeah. with the book. Completely. Right? Right. Atlas. Yeah. Atlas Shrugged. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just had the most profound impact uh, on me. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, I studied Ayn Rand, and then I learned that Ayn Rand really uh, stood, let's say, on the philosophical shoulders mm -hmm. of Aristotle. Okay. And I got into Aristotle. And I realized, this is it. This is, this is my, my guy. And I got really into, I got into philosophy so much. And now, by that time, I'm now in Hawaii. And uh, uh, that's another story how I ended up there. But I entered the... <laughs> I, I decided to get a PhD in philosophy. Okay. And uh, I ended up back at USC at the uh, University of Southern California. Uh, uh, the chairman invited me to, to be an instructor and teach there and get my PhD. And uh, uh, so I, that was my life for, for some time. Mm -hmm. um, and then every, but every summer I go out into the world and saved up every dime that I had and I'd get out there in the world. So when it came time to write my doctoral dissertation, I realized that, I mean, I wanted a PhD to be able to understand the world and to think clearly. Sure. That's what philosophy is supposed to be able to, to do, to be able to think clearly and explain things clearly. And uh, I didn't want to be a, a, a 
professor. That's not what I want to do. I wanted to get back to my, the life that I wanted. So at the same time I wrote my doctoral dissertation on Aristotelian ethics, I ended up writing a book on how to have an adventurous life. Mm -hmm. Because at that time, um, this is another long time ago. This is by now 1976. And, and um, yeah, uh, by that time, there were no adventure travel companies. There wasn't any adventure business. If you wanted to do something that was really for real, mm -hmm. you had to figure it out yourself. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a book called The Adventurer's Guide. And I would tell an adventure story like climbing the Matterhorn and living with editors and different things like that. And then I would tell the reader how he or she could do that themselves. Okay. All the information that they would need, the contacts, the information, you can do it yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, nobody had ever written a book like that. It was always an adventure book. The guy climbs the mountain or goes up the river and meets the tribe and... Mm -hmm. That's the end of the book, right? That was it. So, so at any rate, that was pretty interesting to uh, different people like Johnny Carson <laughs> and Merv Griffin. And that got me on these shows. And I became, I ended up being um, Merv Griffin's co-host or um, uh, whenever he'd have an adventure guest like a Thor Heyerdahl or a Jacques Cousteau or any, any, any you know, professional adventure, he'd have me on as well. And we'd do the show together. So I did the show, I don't know, two, three dozen times. I don't know wow. how many times I did it. So that gave me so much coverage while I decided, well, okay, here we go. I'm, I'm going oh, I'm to start a company. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, Wheeler Adventures, Wheeler Expeditions, uh, et cetera, and I've had it now for <laughs> 40 years. 40 years. <laughs> so so uh, it's one thing after another, although there was a hiatus and uh, – I took time off during the 1980s because I got involved. Uh, I became, um, um, at the time, there were a number of um, guerrilla movements, mm -hmm. freedom fighter guerrilla movements right. in Soviet colonies that had taken up arms and decided they didn't want to take orders and have their lives brutalized mm -hmm. by the Soviets anymore. Uh, in Afghanistan, in Nicaragua, in Angola, in Mozambique, in Ethiopia, in Laos, in Cambodia, etc. Mm -hmm. And I recognized this because um, nobody else knew any, knew the world. I mean, I've been around for a while, right, and doing a lot of things. So, so I knew the world fairly well, and I figured this out. And so I told my friends at the White House, and how I knew friends at the White House is another story. But, but at any rate. I told my friends at the White House, and they said, gee, Jack, nice idea. Nice Prove idea, it. but? Or yeah, right. Prove it. Prove How are you it. Gonna, what are you going to do with this? And I said, well, I'll be right back. <laughs> Six months later, <laughs> I was right back. <laughs> and I just had to talk my way into these movements. They didn't know who I was. I'm some guy. Uh, I'm not from the New York Times, and I sure as hell can't say I'm from the White House. That's not going to happen. So, um, but I talked my way into it. And um, uh, at any rate, I came back to the White House and said, uh, there was a big meeting, and uh, I said to everybody, uh, there really is a worldwide rebellion emerging against mm -hmm. the Soviet Union. And if we support that phenomenon, not just freedom for Nicaragua or Afghanistan, which is a worthy goal, obviously, but, but the phenomenon, we can make a structural assault mm -hmm. on the Soviet empire so that the Soviets have to stop being colonial imperialists and give their, up their empire like the British did and the French did and the Dutch did and the Portuguese did. They all have to give independence to their colonies. Mm -hmm. and it's done. Except the French really never did, but that's another story. At any rate, um, that strategy became known as the Reagan Doctrine. Right. We never called it the Reagan Doctrine. Uh, the press did. But, uh, so, but the, the press is on the architect of the Reagan Doctrine and all that other stuff. But at any rate, and that got that whole Indi Indiana Jones thing. Going. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So... 
backing up to when you were on that, you said it was six months when, for when you, when you went out and when you came back with your findings. You went to Afghanistan. You went to Nicaragua. Where else did you go? At that time, it was um, Afghanistan two or three times. Wow. Um, Nicaragua twice. And um, six weeks in Angola with the Unita guerrillas. Okay. So um, uh, it was those. It was those. Th those three primary, mm -hmm. primary ones. The uh, Renamo in Mozambique hadn't. This was in 1983. Okay. And and Renamo hadn't really gotten up ahead of steam by then. The others were nascent. Mm -hmm. They were just starting. If there's, if there's one takeaway that you had from Afghanistan in the early 80s and to what you see going on there now, or is there any type of um, you know, consistency that you see with how the no. country's been managed, it's, or it's just been all over the place? Well, the Afghanistan, I mean, is really not a real country in certain ways. Sure, that makes sense. Um, because it was created, really, as a buffer Mm -hmm. between the then in the 19th century uh, between Russia coming down and taking over Central Asia mm -hmm. and the British Raj, India coming up uh, through what is now what is now Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't want to touch. And if you look, look at a map of, of Afghanistan, mm -hmm. you know, like, like this, well then in the upper right corner of Afghanistan, there's this finger of land that mm -hmm. sticks out and it touches China, just a couple, few miles, touches China. Okay? And that was to keep the Russian Empire from touching the British Empire. Uh, okay. It's one valley, it's called the Wakhan, the Wakhan Valley. Okay. I've been all through the Wakhan. And, but now it separates Pakistan from Tajikistan. Mm -hmm. But that was the purpose. I mean, it's still there, the, the, the Wakhan, the Wakhan Corridor. Marco Polo went through the Wakhan Corridor. We'll we'll put a map up for the visual for as a visual for the viewers to see exactly what you're talking about. Um, tell me a little bit about the, the visually and just I I, I want to. It's just so fascinating for to, for people to meet somebody that's been to this part of the world that's not involved in you know from a political agenda or or a media agenda. What is it like visually? What is it like culturally? In what way? Um, it, well, it you, depends. I mean, you know, the, the Hindu Kush, mm -hmm. big mountains, sure. biggest mountain is 25, 25 grand, Tirik Mir. But um, it's, and I'm, I'm not sure how you describe it. Very, Afghanistan is mostly very dry. Mm -hmm. And then you enter into the little, a little valley where there's, there's a, almost like a oasis of trees and springs and okay. a village and, 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 and everything else. Uh, but to get back to the difference between back then mm -hmm. and now, um, the real uh, bad guys in, in this regard uh, is the Pakistani intelligence services called the ISI. Uh, Inter-Services Intelligence. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones, the government, within a government in, in Pakistan, and they run the Taliban. They created the Taliban. Wow. And they run the Taliban primarily as a drug smuggling operation mm -hmm. uh, to uh, the Taliban oversee the growing of the, uh, of the uh, opium. And then the uh, ISI makes sure that they've got the right manufacturing to manufacture the heroin and then handles the smuggling. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the main smuggling routes is the Taliban get it out of Afghanistan and turn it over to the Iran Revolutionary Guard, the Pasteran mm -hmm. in Iran. And they get it across to Iran and then they turn it over to a, uh, a Kurdish uh, Marxist group uh, called the PKK, which in turn makes a deal with the uh, with generals in the Turkish army, and the Turkish army makes sure, or the Turkish generals make sure it gets into uh, gets into southeastern Europe, and so that's the that's one of the main routes. Uh, so, uh, uh, but they are uh, um, Islamic radicals in the ISI. Mm -hmm. 
uh, very, very virulently in Addy West, and uh, they are uh, they're responsible. So I, you know, I would hold them if we dis if we somehow were able to disband the ISI and the Taliban would would disband. And taking that exact operation into perspective with your with your studies of philosophy of thinking clearly. When you read news reports on from various media outlets, can you just is it so obvious that you're you're it's talking nonsense compared to what is actually going on on ground? Well, you know, the media the, the media their job is is um emotional. Sure. You know, uh it's to provide entertainment of frisson, of, of excitement, mm -hmm. of, of uh, crisis, of we're in danger, you know, mm -hmm. et cetera, which we've all been through. It's just all a media creation. Um, that's their job. Sure. And because that sells advertising and, and everything else. And uh, there really isn't a lot of journalism. Plus, you know, the agency does this thing too. They have their own agenda. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember, and there's, okay, um, <laughs> there is a movie, a movie called Charlie Wilson's War. Yes, yes. Started starring Tom, Tom, uh, Hanks. Tom Hanks, Tom mm -hmm. Hanks, as Charlie Wilson, Charlie Wilson. Charlie yes. Wilson is my best man. Ah, that's incredible. That's my, my wedding ring. Okay. Unbelievable. Charlie said, here, Jack, put it on, man. Uh, Charlie was my best man when Rebel and I were married. Amazing. 19, 1986. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I had to brief Charlie all the time. Every time I come back uh, and he'd say, you know, uh, he couldn't believe that I, what I was telling him because it just didn't jive with what Langley was telling him. Unbelievable. Because they had their own agenda. Sure. And, and uh, they were blocking primarily. It's like they didn't want to win. Because mm -hmm. the only way to win is going to give the, the Moose, the Mujahideen, mm -hmm. uh, Stinger, Stinger missiles. you got to mm -hmm. take the, the Soviets out of the sky. You take those hind helicopter gunships and those damn MiG-25s out of the sky, and it's done and dusted. I mean, because cause the... the the Afghans, the, the Moose, the Mujahideen, could beat them on the ground. Right. That, that's no, no problem. So, um, finally, finally we were able to get stingers. And the, the, the first stinger went off. It's a long story. A lot of fights. Ronald Reagan had to insist, insist, and, you know, it said, I don't, no more excuses. This is it. Mm -hmm. And so, finally, uh, the first stinger was used uh, September 26, 1986. And uh, 86, 87, 88, a little over two years. Okay. Done. Wow. Gone. Defeated. So that, that's one. And that started the whole domino effect. Because mm -hmm. if they got beaten once, they could get beaten again. Mm -hmm. You know, and it went right into Eastern Europe. And the wall went down. And, I mean, the Soviets retreated from Afghanistan February 15th. 1989. Right. The wall went down November 9th, 1989. Like that. And we predicted that. We were not surprised at all. When you were thinking, uh, after everything had happened, you know, that we're getting into the mid-90s now, did you ever think back and have a reflective moment and said, did my findings have, did they, were they the catalyst to to pave way for the fall of the Soviet Union? Well, um, there's all these books on it. I mean, mm -hmm. how, how it happened. Of course, of course happened. you've got all these people who said, it'll never happen, you, it, you're crazy, it can never happen. And, every, and now, of course, once it happens, oh, I knew that. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, I knew that. You know, yeah. you know etc. <laughs> Nobody knew that. I mean, at the Heritage Foundation, which is the most conservative operation and think tank in Washington. Mm -hmm. I gave a talk in May of 1989. May, right? 1989. Yeah. The coming collapse of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. 
or the Kremlin collapse of the Soviet Empire is what it, what it really was. Mm-hmm. I gave a talk. And, and I said, folks, now listen to me. The Berlin Wall is going to be down. It'll be down less than two years. Oh, easy. I mean, that's, a, you know, that's about as far as out as I can imagine it. And they laughed. Now, this is some bunch of conservatives. Sure. Right? And they laughed. And so I said, okay. Okay. <laughs> you guys laugh all you want. That's not a problem. I just have one request. That you remember, on this day, I said that. Mm-hmm. You remember it. And so that's a rep that I have in Washington because a lot of people remembered. Right, right. <laughs> because it's May, okay? June, July, August, September, October, November. I mean, less than six months. Right. Down, down. Unbelievable, Jack. Yeah. I, I think that, you know, through, throughout visiting these incredible parts of the world and studying and knowing was it easier for you was it easy for you to adapt anywhere that you go if you if or or do you find yourself that you have to entrench yourself in history and education educating yourself before you get on a plane and go somewhere well you, you try to do both right but lots of times you're in a situation where you know you're just going in cold yeah you're going I mean, in cold. any one of these places you know mm-hmm. cold but um you know, it's very, very interesting. Like you said, I've had the opportunity to go to every single country in the world, yep. and I don't know, 200 or so um, jurisdictions, separate mm-hmm. little places and islands and enclaves, and etc. And, you know, cultures are different. Peoples have different beliefs and ways of doing things mm-hmm. and everything else. But there's a very interesting phenomenon that anthropologists know about called human universals. Okay. And, and a human universal is something, uh, some kind of belief or some kind of activity or practice, etc., that every single culture known to history, sociology, or anthropology has. Mm-hmm. Music, dancing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Fashion. Um, uh, so there's there's like over two hundred of these things, mm-hmm. and so th- that means that we are dispersed throughout the world, but we all came from Africa, mm-hmm. uh, and while we were there, and while we established our initial niche in evolution. Why, when we dispersed, we carried those genetic, what, read-only memories <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> right. uh, within us that everybody has. And so if you tap into those, why, you can find that you can relate to almost anybody. I mean, there's, you know, people that you you obviously can't or wacko or in some way. But for the most part, I have found it, um, Rebel has seen it many times. Mm -hmm. I mean, many times. Okay, we're here in Portugal. We're in a taxi, right? An Uber, right? Right. We're in an Uber Mm -hmm. and with another couple. We're going to to someplace. and And the driver is from... I forget where the heck he was now, but he was in some place in Africa, I believe. Mm-hmm. And and so I said, "Where are you from?" "I'm from here." "Oh, really? Whereabouts from?" "Well, we got here." And in about thirty seconds, we had a rapport. Mm-hmm. We were going, "Oh, really?" And all of a sudden, we're we're talking back and forth, and Revel is sitting there watching this. It's just like thirty seconds. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so. It is easy to relate to people's core humanity, is what mm-hmm. I'm saying. Yeah. I you know, because completely. everybody has it. And we're all humans. We're all human beings with a common identity and a common soul, human soul. Mm-hmm. And um, if, you find, if you can relate to that, mm-hmm. why, pretty much, it's not a problem from then on. And life is easy. And I, I wish that the world is um, is conscious of that. Uh, we're, we're living in a very crazy time. And I, I think that the message that you get through these types of experiences 
uh, you take with you, like you said, collecting experiences. It lasts a lifetime, and it gives you a more more of a it gives you more. I mean, we already have this innate sense of humanity, but it just makes it more prevalent into our psyche. Um, yeah. Now, taking taking that into perspective, is there something is is was, is there a lesson that you've learned through uh, through making a mistake that you were just like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I shouldn't think like that, or this is not the way to be. There's a difference between you know politics, religion, and humanity. Does anything come up into your mind as like like kind of like an oh my gosh moment where you had to take a step back and just say like, okay, this is not the right way to do things. This is how we need to do things. Hmm. I'd have to think about that. Okay. I mean, I'm sure there is. I mean, obviously, there is. It just nothing comes. Sure. No worries. You know, no worries. bubbling, bubbling up, <laughs> uh, uh, bubbling up right away. And I can give one example of, um, uh, you know, we we read a lot about Islam, mm -hmm. right? Sure. And um, Islamic crazies are another ISIS. Mm -hmm. you know, et cetera, is another right. matter. But well, that's the difference between the Mujahideen mm -hmm. who are fighting for their freedom and the Taliban who, you know, blow up uh, Bamiyan statues and want to commit uh, terrorist acts and, and befriended Al-Qaeda Al and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so my best friend among the Mujahideen was uh, a guy named Rakim. Abdul Rahim. And um, Rahim, uh, he spoke some English and he said, Jack, I'd like to ask you a question. And I said, What's that? And he said, Would you consider becoming a Muslim? And it hit me cold, you know. I, <laughs> you know okay. <laughs> uh, and I said, uh, And I began to stumble a little bit. And, and he said, well, can I tell you why? And I said, sure. And he said, it's so that when we die, we'll be friends in heaven. Wow. Wow. That hits you. Whoa. Wow. You know, that was, and I just said, oh, Rakim, thank you. I mean, geez, look. Wow, man, buddy, wow. you know, uh, you know, I mean, that, but I, you'll never forget that. And it gives you, a, you know, real different perspective, completely, you know, <laughs> completely from what's purported. Right, right. Of course. So that, that's the only example I can, I yeah. can uh, come up with. That is an incredible story that is, that has, that's one of the top, that would be like one of the top three moments of my life, just like in terms of just <laughs> connecting with another human being. Yeah. I, to, to echo that sentiment, I've traveled all throughout the Muslim world and I have received nothing but, but kindness. And again, it's kind of a different capacity going in as a, as a, from in the tourism business, but still when you, when you connect with somebody, you can sense the goodness that's there. And, and, and I, I, I absolutely love that story. Um, mm -hmm. If, if, do you have any, we're going to wrap things up. We're coming up towards the end of our time here. Um, do you have any? That went comments? quick. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, we, we're, 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 we're actually pushing it. Um, <laughs> but you, you, you've been, the, the, the wisdom and the stories, and I don't mean this as insincere flattery at all. Uh, these are powerful lessons that the world needs to hear, and I, especially today. Um, do you have any parting comments or words of wisdom with what's going on today and, um, and how you see things moving forward over the next few, few months, few years? Well, don't ever believe the media. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we totally and they've got that. some agenda, right? For sure. And For it's sure. not yours. <laughs> <laughs> no, certainly um, not. Uh, it would be to think for yourself. I would agree with that one trillion percent. Think for yourself. Make up your own mind uh, and uh, ask questions. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, mm -hmm. um, he, um, 
he had a statement once that uh, I've never forgotten. Uh, he said, we are told to have the courage of our convictions. I say, have the question to, cur to question our convictions. Okay. Because it's only through questioning them that you can determine if they're right. Right. If, they're, if you've got something to really, really hold on to. If you haven't got the courage to question it, then you're just blind and you're just going down a path and you don't know where the hell you're on. I love that. But, but, if, but if you have the courage to question it, you say, well, could I be wrong? Am I right, really right here? Is this fact that I believe that I believe is a fact? Is it for real? Maybe I better check that out. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you one a little vignette. People, people are, 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 are you, this must happen to you too. It must happen to everybody. But you've got friends who send you all this stuff because all they do is they find some, somebody sends them something and then they just blast it out to everybody in the known universe that they know as, as, is, as it's true. Mm -hmm. And I'm always telling him because I have, you know, I, you know, it's not some, I don't know about this one, you know, and I'm not going to send this out to anybody yeah. unless I verify it. And so, you know, the old Ronald Reagan thing, trust, but verify. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I have just got a, a good nose mm -hmm. for this sort of stuff. And so I'm constantly telling certain friends, there's one buddy just, he just, he, he's got a, a tick and he just has to do it. I keep telling him, he says, listen, this is a hoax. Here's why. It's not just that Snope says it's a hoax, but uh, it's, this is not the case. And here's why. And here's the, what, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And give him some sources. And, and now, of course, now he says, Jack, is this true? Is this really true? <laughs> you know, I have to write it. No, it's not. Or, huh, what do you know? You know, but but have the courage to question what you think believe what you think is true, because that's the only way you can verify that it's true. Mm -hmm. Right? You don't have confirmation. What they call confirmation bias. Right. So think for yourself. Think for yourself. I love it. Question, Jack. I cannot thank you enough. This has been awesome. And all right. I look forward to speaking with you in the future. Continue working together. You've been a great friend, and I really appreciate everything. Thank you. Well, great. Great, uh, great talking to you, Justin. All right. Take care, and we'll chat soon. Thanks. Thank you for listening to Smart Aspirations. Justin Hoff is the manager of Swaggy Swan Travel. For all travel-related inquiries, please visit www.swaggyswan.com. That's www.swaggyswan.com. And click Inquiries. Have a stupendous day. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>